Restricting access to reproductive health care hurts women in so many overtly traumatizing ways. Some women will be forced to endure unwanted pregnancies, to risk their health and safety against their will, and to go through dangerous miscarriages unaided. Those are the obvious, cruel ways in which women in this new regime are dehumanized. But let's talk about some of the more subtle and insidious ways in which all women of childbearing age are negatively impacted by the decision to overturn Roe v. Wade. This decision impacts every American woman. It diminishes the status and the value and freedom of every American woman, not just those who become pregnant. Women who become pregnant and seek an illegal or extremely inconvenient abortion or who end up having an unwanted birth are clearly impacted very gravely. But we are all impacted on some level. You, me, red states, blue states, all American women, no matter where you live, are impacted, and I want to explain how in this video. A woman's ability to be competitive in the workplace is central to her liberation as an individual. Like it or not, we live in a capitalist society, and being able to support herself through her labor is crucially important to a woman's independence and dignity. It's not that long ago that women were excluded from the professional world. Through the mid-20th century, women's professional options were limited to support roles, like secretaries, and to teaching and nursing, and that was pretty much it. Women have always worked in menial factory labor and low-level service jobs, but the real professional jobs were the domain of men and a woman in any job risked losing her career if she became pregnant. The ability for women to take control of their reproductive system was a huge leap forward in women's liberation, both through oral contraception and through access to legal abortion. And those two things allowed women the freedom to pursue a much wider range of education paths and careers and it somewhat leveled the playing field between women and men. Women are still at a disadvantage biologically, but those things made a massive difference in how employers viewed women within the workplace. And now we've taken a giant leap backward, which I feel is intentional. The consequences are not going to be unintended consequences, since the ultimate goal of conservatives is to diminish women and put them back in the kitchen, back in their place. So what are some of those consequences? It's already the case that employers discriminate against women for their ability to get pregnant and the possibility that a woman will get pregnant. And that is one reason for the wage gap. It's technically illegal to discriminate against a woman because of her ability or her plans to get pregnant but it's extraordinarily difficult to prove and it's almost never regulated or prosecuted, especially within the hiring process. So for example, if an employer is considering two candidates, a 30-year-old man and a 30-year-old woman, there is a natural bias toward the man because there is no risk that he is going to have a baby. Although most employers don't offer paid maternity benefits and most states don't either, women who give birth are entitled to unpaid time off under the Federal Family and Medical Leave Act, which is a minimum of 12 weeks. And that's a massive inconvenience to an employer. And as a result, to offset that perceived risk, an employer will offer a lower salary to female employees. From a purely unemotional, economic, and mathematical standpoint, that makes sense. But from a feminist standpoint, obviously this is a way that women are discriminated against and not allowed to fully participate and be seen as equal and of the same value as men. So that already existed, and now with the restricted access to abortion, this issue is made much worse. Not only will employers worry that some women who would have had abortions will now become mothers instead, uh, but they also have to consider that women who would have had convenient abortions in the past will now be forced to take time off to travel and have inconvenient abortions, which was not an issue before. 
at a minimum, that would require time off, which is an extra cost to the employer. Again, a cost not associated with a male employee, reinforcing the idea that it's just simpler and less of a hassle to hire men over women. This has a material negative impact on women's competitiveness in the job market. And again, this affects the way employers perceive all women, not just those who actually become pregnant. Another way women lose competitiveness versus men in the job market is through a relative inability to migrate. What does that mean? Tressie McMillan Cottom wrote about this recently. With Roe v. Wade toppled, we do not have the same rights in all labor markets. In a global market, an empowered worker is one who can migrate. With Dobbs, women cannot assume that we can safely work in Idaho the same way that we can in Oregon or Washington. I cannot negotiate wages or time off with an employer with the same risk profile as a man. An employer who offers lower pay in a state with abortion care indirectly benefits from women's inability to take our labor on the open market across the nation. That is, some women will feel locked into living in certain areas, whereas men won't feel that same pressure. And because employers know this, they can take advantage of that by paying women less. Now, some employers in red states are offering employees travel benefits should they need abortion care. And I posted this headline with the commentary, Our American Dystopia, a couple of months back. On the surface, this seems like, wow, these companies are stepping up and they're making up for this massive failing of the government. But really, this is just another way we are beholden to the whims of our benevolent corporate overlords. It's not a good solution. Relative to legal abortion, it's a very bad solution on many levels. In addition to what I mentioned about employers seeing this as a potential inconvenience that makes female candidates less desirable, such a benefit actually reduces wages. This is not coming out of the CEO's salary. Any non-wage benefit offered by a company is typically offset by lower wages. These policies also force female employees to disclose private health information to their bosses which could be uncomfortable, embarrassing, or worse. And these policies can also be used as a bargaining chip against unions. And rather than being truly benevolent policies at their core, these policies are all about this being a cheaper option for a company than having a female employee give birth and need time off for that, potentially. One final way this negatively impacts women is in college education. There are excellent competitive colleges located in some of these red states, in Texas, Louisiana, Tennessee, Missouri, etc. And the expectation is that there will be fewer female applicants to those schools and more applicants to coastal schools of the same tier. And that will increase competition for all students and ultimately may limit some young women's access to a quality education. One might argue that some of these effects are subtle, small, or theoretical. But even if the effects are small, they're only impacting women. And that's the point I want to underline. Men are not impacted in these ways, which reinforces the idea that men are whole people out there doing their thing unimpeded. And women have all these barriers they have to overcome, and now even more barriers. Women are at a natural biological disadvantage to men. Even if you don't have children, most women have periods every month for 30 to 40 years. And many women are quite sick on a regular basis and just power through. And men aren't, and they don't have to do that. And an elevated society should be doing everything to account for this and to make women whole versus men and to reduce our biological disadvantages through access to great, well-researched healthcare and workplace policy that accounts for our natural differences so that those women who choose to participate don't have to do so at a disadvantage. We're not born on a level playing field being in these complicated and challenging bodies. And government policy can either enhance those challenges or help alleviate them. 
This overturning of Roe v. Wade is the government kicking women when we're already down. And as I said, the goal of conservatives is to move us backward, to move us back into the kitchen, to promote the idea that a woman's role in this world is as a mother, and that's it, and that she doesn't have the same value as a man. Our struggle in feminism is to assert that we are human, we have personhood, we are whole people, we deserve respect, rights, dignity, and opportunity on par with a man. And our struggle will continue. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye.